right of the backpack that I've just saved as Easter eggs. If you want them, you're welcome to have this presentation to the school, uh, the keynote. Oh, the PowerPoint. So yeah, whenever you're ready, I'm ready. I think we'll go ahead and get started. There might be some more people moseying in. Thank you all for coming. Um, Dr. Singh is a sleep guru, and I'm excited to hear him. He um, kind of got on this parent education bandwagon, and then he released a book recently that I started to read myself as a parent, and um, just lots of good tidbits in that book. So if you're wanting more after this, uh, just lots of good information in that. Uh, so without further ado, thank you so much for coming. I know your schedule is crazy busy. And so thank you for taking time out to educate all of us with your excellent knowledge. Well, thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a joy to be here. And in fact, the love of my life who sits right in the last row happened because of sleep research at University of Illinois. She doesn't know I was going to say this, but she had her research position in the same building, and so did I. And mine was on the second floor. The sleep research lab was on the second floor of that building. Hers was on the seventh. And I unnecessarily could easily walk up one flight stairs, but no, seeing her, I would follow her and I would stand in the elevator <laughs> and hit two. Uh, and then it's getting off a tweet here, yeah, let's see if run up the stairs. And, now, and that to about 20 years later, we're here. So that happened about 20 years ago. So I, oh, I owe everything in my life really to sleep. Uh, <laughs> so it chose me by fluke, I didn't choose it. Today we're here to talk about um, everything sleep and focusing on the kids a little more. Uh, but if you have questions, please stop. Let's make it a fun chat rather than yet another PowerPoint slide coming at you with you know all kinds of animations. And I'm a little sucker for toys, so if things move a lot, let me know. Uh, that's me. I now uh, am the director of the little sleep center on the south side called the Indiana Sleep Center. I also uh, now that I've spent so many years, the academy had no choice but said, "Fine, you're not leaving, so we'll give you fellowship in the three weeks. <laughs> have it." I also started teaching a little at Marion because sleep is so undertaught overall. So both year med students hang with me for about six months of the year uh, as an elective to learn about this because um, it's just not taught. Uh, and so they, they love it, I love that. And then I also uh, and help uh, the best team in the NBA right now, the Indiana <laughs> <laughs> on my roster, the Indiana base has been working with them for a while. So guess what, even they need sleep. And they need good sleep because that's the edge that they have or can access uh, to play better. So it's been fun. And of course, this is happening at the best school uh, in the world, and right there in the middle, right? So don't forget that. Above the Pacers. I mean, None of you above the, right there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, Lydia still says this is the most useful piece of furniture that I've bought, the Apple Pencil. I should return it right away, but we'll see. I do consult, so I had to, in full etiquette, to disclose that none of the contents of the talk really are influenced by that. I do advise some panels and uh, some molecular research in the sleep field as well. So, is it nap time or is it map time? I guess somebody was yawning. Uh, <laughs> yawn was my favorite. So, so how are we going to do this? We'll just structure it around sleep. Why, what, how much, who cares? You know, my friend Tom, uh, Thomas Alvarez, that is, invented the enemy of sleep, which is artificial light. Since then, really, it's become a challenge. If, if you think about it, that was a starting point where we could control artificial life. So Tom, thank you, but no thank you. Uh, sleep deprivation, all of us have felt it, all of us feel it. Uh, we put some quantifications and some views on that, how we look in kids and adults and adolescents. Sleep disorders in kids, there are lots, but these three essentially all of us have interacted with, right? Parasomnia, the talk they walk, nightmares, um, snoring is, uh, is not benign, and it's not a sign of good sleep and insomnia, right? Not sleeping uh, enough or in the right quantity when, when they should be. So, and there are flavors of insomnia. They change a little as the kids grow older. And then melatonin has had a 500% increase in the last seven, eight years. So I'm sure you guys have questions. Melatonin, fun fact, is over the counter as a, as a supplement in the US. Parts of the world have it as prescription. Canada has it behind the counter. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot going on there. We'll try to unpack a little bit. Uh, and then, better sleep for all. Everybody on that bus? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, good. Uh, why? So that's the, it looks like James Bond from the 70s, but that is my one of my favorite celebrities, Sir Alan Rekshafen from Chicago, who said this in the 70s. 
and consume this for a second because it is quite counterintuitive. If it really did serve a absolutely vital function, it's the biggest mistake evolution ever made, right? Because think about it, evolution says don't die, make more of your own, gather food. Basically, like survive, don't die, gather food, make more of your own. That's it. Every animal is trying to basically do this, every living creature. And in sleep, and every animal does sleep, even plants have a rest wake cycle. You can be killed, you can't gather food, and you truly can't make more of your own. So doesn't it sound completely against evolution? It's a third of your life. So if it's there, it has to be important. Otherwise, geez, what an error in theory. So, and we've learned that it is in fact true. In fact, in fact, it's not function, it's functions is how we were learning. What makes us sleep? And in 1993, this came out, right? So, it's a fascinating way to look at it. So, every day when you wake up right now, we are right here at 9 a.m. It's called the two-process model. 9 a.m. is happening right now, 20 past. That's when our homeostatic drive for sleep is the lowest. That is your sleep pressure. It's like a flush film. Imagine you just flushed the toilet. It's empty. You won't flush again because it needs to fill all the way to the top for the best flush. That's what your sleep pressure building happens every day. And then you have what we call the circadian alerting signal, which is high when there is light. So it's an alerting signal which alerts you. And as the day progresses, your sleep pressure builds. And your alerting signal also keeps you up. Because in three hours, you'd be ready to take a short nap. But you don't. You can push through till about 2 or 3 because of this circadian alerting signal that goes on. And then you see this little low. That's your 3 p.m. donut right there. Oh, where's my donut? <laughs> we all feel that. It's not quite related to food. We think, oh, it's a heavy lunch. We've debunked that by now. It's a natural low. It's asking you to take a little bit of a break. And then you see the second wind of alerting signal that happens in the evening. All of us feel that, right? Geez, I was tired at 4. And now, whoo, I have this spring of energy. And it does that. And, and then right here where the magic occurs. Your peak sleep pressure, your peak alerting signal, they say, all right, it's time to go. So the decay of your sleep pressure happens when you start sleeping. And the dimming of the sunlight, I mean the sun sets. That's why these dim light concepts come from. And I, I dug into this a little. So now all of the stuff you guys read will start to make a lot of sense. Why do they say no light in the evening? Why do they say to our kids, stop staring at your screen, blue light? All of this makes sense from right here. That's why you're very sensitive. So about 10 p.m., your alerting signal drastically drops because guess what? Vitamin M is beginning to rise. That's your melatonin naturally in your little pineal gland in your brain, the last hormone to be discovered. Uh, it starts to spit in a 24-hour rhythm. That's why, and it's very sensitive to light. It's like a touch-me-not flower. You've seen those, you've touched it, close, that's exactly what it is. When it's sun is set, all oh, these, these are not very bright in general, but you get them close to your face, they start to suppress your melatonin. Suppressing of melatonin is signaling your brain to wake up. Your circadian alert, alerting signal starts to poke back up again. So now, that's why you can't sleep if you have too much light in your face. So now these happen in the ideal scenario, melatonin peaks, your sleep pressure sort of really uh, starts to decay as you sleep. Like the toilet flush clicks again and slowly flushes out in the next seven, eight hours. Life is good again, cycle starts again. So this is kind of the two process model that happens every day in all of us. Uh, <clears throat> so now we've all heard of REM sleep. The f one of my favorite bands happens to have that name. So I'll, I'll uh, <laughs> always be, have a soft spot for rapid eye movement sleep. Was discovered only about 60 years ago, about 180 miles north uh, west of here. Chicago, at the University of Chicago, um, they discovered this in the 1953. So we all thought sleep is equal to, oh, everything shutting down, everything just chilling out, but really not. That does happen, but every 90 minutes you get this blue bar, which is rapid eye movement sleep. This is your awake, this is the first hour of sleep, one, two, and three stages where the sleep waves basically get slower, your brain waves get slower and bigger. And it's like giant vacuum cleaners happening throughout the body. And then 90 minutes later, you get this burst of eyes going crazy, dreaming happening, and the brain wave revs up as if you slammed your gas pedal while the car was in neutral. Broom, 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 broom. And then you let it go again. 
uh, for 90 minutes, broom, broom. So there's something there. We don't know fully what all it does for us. There's memory, there's learning, there's cognition, there's mood. We know it's involved in that, but we're still unpacking this. Uh, and that's what happens. As you see, as the night progresses, you see more and more blues, which is dream sleep. That's why when you wake up, like, oh man, I was in, I was in Vienna. Oh, yeah. You all remember that morning when you wake up, there's that dreaming happening because your REM sleep, REM sleep, rapid eye movement is concentrated in the last two to three hours. 80, 78% of your REM sleep is in the last two to three hours. That's why when we say, oh, I'm only getting six out of the seven or eight, imagine you're losing half of your REM sleep. Although it, think, it feels like you've lost only one-seventh or two-sevenths of your seven hours, but it really is half of your room sleep gone. And you do that chronically because you have to get up, you have to you know, be at places, do a Netflix binging <coughs> at, uh, till midnight because you had your blue blockers on and you had your night mode on. Uh, it doesn't give you the license to do that because you suddenly keep your REM sleep. Now you're going to be moodier, crabbier, more negative. And these are the papers, this is not me. This is not my house. Uh, this is <laughs> this is actually research that has come out in the last five years. Less REM sleep, even kids actually, and it really translates into kids as well. You'll see the moody ones. You, as teachers, as excellent educators, you know who's had a good night, who hasn't. I mean, it's easy. You can tell by now. And this is where the mechanics really are coming from. Um, and so comes to this, the most expensive washing machine that you have ever seen, and all of you own. And it costs that. Any idea what that is? That is your lifetime of sleep. Because seven to eight hours a night in an average expected lifespan of about 80 plus years, you're probably going to get more. You're probably, with inflation, that probably costs more now. And equal to, it's a good thing. So you multiply eight hours a night into a lifespan of 80 years, you get 13.5 million minutes of sleep. And that, if you if so use it, and all are not using this, given to us. That's where, that's where that comes from. And the functions of sleep, we're still unpacking growth, learning, immunity, repair, performance, and memory are just the starting of how we are beginning to see sleep. As you'll see, uh, the athletes, they sleep 10 plus hours. All of them have now gone on all these social media platforms saying, hey, talking about their sleep and recovery and injury and less injury they sleep more, more injury they don't, recovery is longer. So it's there in all of us. If, if they can get coached to play better, I think all of us should also at least look into the idea of, hey, how can we protect this complimentary $15 million beautiful washing machine that the, you know, the creators have given us and we are not using well. Uh, how much? That's the other question, right? Is seven, eight, five, four? Oh, I, you, how many people you do have you interacted with in your life who say, oh, I just need five. I'm good with five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Though they think they're supermen, superwomen, but they're not. You ask them, so how about on the weekend? Oh, yeah, weekend I sleep in. Every ten. And then how about the seven cups of coffee that you're having through the day, you know, to compensate. So you're not really doing well on five. All the science says under six, you're going to pay somewhere with that sleep loss. Something you will have to pay with. And it changes over time, right? And there's quality and quantity aspects of it. And it changes as we get it. So now we hit... You know, if we, as we 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it changes how, how we sleep, how us, it's like a suspension on a beautiful car. When you buy it, drive it off the road, it's great. You can take a hero, even the R roads outside of the <laughs> and the construction and the pothole, you won't feel it. But drive a car is about 20 years in, into that, like 200,000 miles and not drive, it doesn't feel the same. Same brand, same car, right? So we have one car, which is health, our health. So protect. Is protection is key. So then this came out. Uh, the academy looked at all empiric data. It's very hard to do this research. Think about it, right? How do you recruit kids or parents to consent? It's like, all right, you can sleep deprive my kid for months and see what happens to their health. And then we can come up with these beautiful guidelines. Would you volunteer your kid? You, you won't, right? It's hard to do this research. They've collected bits and pieces and have come up with these ranges. Infants, yeah, they sleep. They sleep next to a base woofer, right? They can sleep. That's how high the sleep drive is. Kids will sleep 12, 16 hours. That's more than half the day. That's how important it is to their growth. 11 to 14 hours a day for a toddler, including naps. Preschool, it starts to get less. And the, the, the biggest takeaway is right here. This group, right? Our adolescents and teens. 
Jeez, it's an epidemic of sorts. These, they listen to you. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can trick them, bribe them, confuse them. But the teens, good gravy. Uh, and I'm yes. already, uh, yes, I was 11, and I'm already shaken thinking about how I'm going to fight with that. So, 8 to 10 hours, they're not getting this, right? They get up early for the school bus, school, they go late with their screens, they have a natural delay. And we'll unpack this a little more as we go down. How do you deal with that? Um, and then, sleep deprivation looks different in younger kids, in adolescents, and adults. You and I can say, geez, look, all of you have your cup of coffee or water in front of you, right? So how does a three-year-old tell you that? They don't. How does a six-year-old tell you that? Hey, mom, can we stop for a venti at Starbucks? They won't do that. <laughs> uh, so they will tell you with hyperactivity, with aimless activity. 70% of ADHD diagnoses, and this is from the American Academy of Pediatrics, have a sleep issue, and typically sleep deprivation. And deprivation comes in two flavors, quantity and quality loss. So that's, you have to remember that. They may be sleeping seven, eight hours, but if they're getting up, tossing, turning, snoring, at night kicking, moving, the pets interfering. So that can eat into that quantity. So now you have hyperactivity, poor impulse control, you know, saying things that really sh they shouldn't be, out of turn, behavior, cognitive impairment, academic learning, memory, recall, everything suffers. And this has been, it's out there. This is old news, I call it. And attention deficit. And then they say, how about making up sleep on the weekend? We've got a busy week, or we'll sleep until 10, 11 on the weekend. Does that help? Can we add up? Well, they've shown this, that it's better than the alternative, which is to not. But it's not superior or even doesn't come close to the regular 7, 8, 9 hours that they get. That attention span, that recall, that mood, it doesn't, it doesn't come close. It's better than not doing it at all. But again, that should be a pass to say, hey, I'll catch up on the weekend. doesn't add up. It's like driving on a bad road for five days and then saying, oh yeah, I'll take the highway on the weekends. Have you undone the damage to the car? No. So that's sort of the seeds you want to think about. And adults, they'll experience sleepiness, fatigue, irritability, and then the adolescents are somewhere in the middle. They'll, they'll start to demonstrate flavors of both. So, so look at that. And that's why attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, it's, it's treated with what? you'll see often it's treated with stimulants. You can say, wait, they have a lot of extra energy, now we're giving them more? How does that work? So it tells you that it doesn't. It's not two negatives multiplying into a positive. It's basically their expression of lack of energy, fatigue, sleepiness, manifesting. So now if you remove that fatigue by artificially adding more energy, now you solve the problem. You see how that works? Like, wait, hyperactivity, shouldn't we give them something to calm down? But no, it actually, that's, that's how it proves your theory that, yeah, this, that hyperactivity is really a form of sleep loss, at least in many cases. And then there are other angles, elements as well. And then we come to these man-made tragedies. You all have seen these. That happened on national TV in 1986. This one was the East Coast train. It almost felt for a time that every two years you would see this, either on the West Coast or the East Coast. A train engineer falls asleep, speeding across his own, and, you know, people hurt. Air France, the case closed, I think, a year ago, just a few months ago. Flight takes off South America, everybody 200 plus on board. Air France die because the pilots don't react in time to changing weather. Um, and then Three Mile Island, this was uh, heat, heat alarms going off, not responding. Shift workers, 4 a.m. So then, all these essentially are man-made. And what the common thread is, and 100,000 of these happen every year. This is five years old data. And all these have one common theme behind them, some form of sleep loss. Sleep deprivation has done this. And drunk has a law against it, right? Drunk, four Ds of deadly driving. Drunk, drugged has a law. Distracted, fidgety fidget, has a law in many states. Drowsy doesn't have a law. So drowsy driving is, is really, really an epidemic. And so something, again, to think about. That's all phases of sleep deprivation. The, the, the challenge scenario was that the, they were working so hard to meet launch date and time because they have a window uh, to take these things off the ground and into the space that they were just not sleeping. They were just overtiming themselves. And they, that's what, and these files are closed and this is what some of the theories are, but it's true, it happened. Um, <clears throat> now, sleep disorders and kids, how do they look? So parasomnia, how many of you have known a kid or in a family or a niece or nephew who sleepwalked? Talked. Nightmares, 
uh, terrors, right? Or a friend who's dealing with this. Yes, it's very common. And uh, how many of you know who, of kids or adults who snore? Snoring is very common. And the myths are, oh, I'm not 300 pounds, 200 pounds, the kid, I can't snore. Not true. Anatomy, genetics, family history j play just as much of a role. <coughs> and then insomnia. How many of you know children who don't sleep well as, as you would like them? One. Yes? Well, lucky for the rest of you. <laughs> Two. All right, three. That means not three of us, right? So, yes, yeah, so <coughs> they're out there. They just. And then children and adolescents. Um, Let's talk about parasomnia. So break this down really quickly. They are undesirable behaviors during the sleep period. They are classified into those two buckets. One that happened in non-REM sleep in the first half of the night and the others are REM parasomnia, the REM nightmares. Basic difference is they recall everything in the nightmares. They are consolable. It's in the second half of the night. The green goblin, the monster, the dragon was chasing Mima. Oh my god. Oh, they are, you, know, you can feel that they are scared with this. And they describe it really well and they're consolable. You can say, no, you're fine. Johnny, you're fine. Look, you're here, it's home, okay, fine. And they can be consolable, they go back. And this can be recurrent and it can be problematic. Whereas the, the first half parasomnia are a little more trickier. Night terror, they don't know what they're afraid of. Screaming. <laughs> and they are just inconsolable. Uh, and it freaks the parents out. Sometimes their eyes are open, sometimes their eyes are not. Sleepwalking, another dangerous one, right? can get from amusing to dangerous pretty quickly. Amusing is, oh, they're walking, look, they're trying to cook by the night light, they're sipping, and it looks very sort of amusing, all the way to what are they doing in the bathtub with the tap on, and they're sitting there. So it can get from amusing to dangerous pretty quickly, and if it's a teen, and this can persist up to puberty at times. By 10 or 12 years, most of these fade because the sleep-wake switches in the brain mature, so the circuits mature. So you sleep, you sleep. If you if you are awakened by something, you get stuck half awake. So that's what these are. All of them, you can understand them as you're sleeping, you're waking. And there, there shouldn't be a halfway point. Either the light is on or it's off. But in these cases, the switches flicker a bit. So they're not quite on, not quite off. And they demonstrate these behaviors based on what happened in what part of night. And so safety is key when you talk about when they move places. A teen waking up in a closed garage, cranks the car and sits there. You know, it can get from amusing to, to not so very quickly. And they don't know what they were doing. The other day I had a patient in clinic. The cops called, uh, um, the Taco Bell uh, called the cops because there was a naked man in the driveway ordering food. Like with bare minimum clothing. Four weeks ago. And so then they said, oh, this is a sleep issue. And then he came and he sorted it and we started talking through it. And he has ended up having sleep apnea, uh, which was waking him up. But it can happen. So these things can happen, and they do. Uh, again, we talk about the first half and the second half. So the dreaming piece will happen in the second half of the night. Why? Because your REM sleep is concentrated in the second half. The terrors and the walks will happen here because these are all what we call stage three or slow wave sleep parasomnias. They are and what do you do? I'll tell you what you do. And the, the common questions are do we wake them? Do we talk to them? Do we console them? Do we lead them back to bed? Some of these things are uh, common questions and I have this fairly straightforward answers. There are more, but I chose the greatest hits for you that are, you will interact with most commonly. Uh, sleepwalking terrors, and this is from the academy. This is Suresh Kodagal from Hopkins who, who does a lot of his research, writes about it. Bed wetting is another common one that I didn't put on there. It happens. And it can be from other health conditions, stress, sometimes rarely seizures, sometimes sleep apnea, snoring can be manifesting as bedwetting. Uh, and then it slowly fades off as they age. If it doesn't, then it needs an evaluation. And then you have the dream sleep nightmares and some of this stuff, which is mostly seen in adults, REM sleep behavior disorder. You'll see this, this very pleasant gentleman screaming and hitting the wall in the middle of the night acting out their dreams, dream enactment. That's in the adults, and that can be a, a, a subtle hint into some neurodegenerative conditions such as Parkinson's coming down the road. So that's a detailed discussion for another period, but it, the, the kids usually will live on the left side of the screen here. And all of us have had what we call hypnic jerks. Hypnic jerks, as soon as you're able to, and all of you experience this, tell me if you have, you're just falling asleep, and you just startle yourself away. It's not a snort, it's just as if you have to fall into a swimming pool and they go, 
Was that going to hit this? That's telling you that, hey, uh, this is not, you haven't slept enough in the last few days. The body is saying, sleep more. That's a clue that you're hungry for sleep. So, all of us around this. And it's nothing to worry. Even if it gets repetitive a little bit, it's not, it's nothing, it's nothing serious. It's usually the night. As long as you don't fall off the bed onto something and hit yourself. Um, generally, you don't. Okay, uh, quickly. Yeah, so we've gone through this. When do they occur? First to second half movements. Uh, this is an important one I threw there because if they start to do repetitive things, then you and they're not contextual, they don't remember, then there is this question of a seizure disorder or a breakthrough seizure taking place. And some kids, unfortunately, will have this epilepsy and seizure diagnosis, and it may start here. So watch for that. Again, very, very low percentage. I don't want you to go home today and say, oh my God. Um, you know, Chrissy was moving repetitively and Singh said, oh, there may be a seizure. Don't, it's not that. So put it all together in terms of how repetitive, how frequent, what are the daytime impacts of that. And do they recall the episode in the morning or not? And then these days, thanks to Ring and Google and all these videos, and so if you record that, if you, if you feel like it needs to go to the pediatrician, you could actually record that. And it'll have a timestamp on it, so the pediatrician will know what time this of this was taking place, and they'll exactly see the morphology and the motions that the kid is doing, so it gets easier. So you, it'll save you a lot of description and question answer, and you'll get to it, and, and you'll get to the reassurance part of the treatments quite quickly. All right. Uh, reassurance is key. How do we fix this? Don't awaken, don't discuss. That's the big thing. So if you think they were acting out or doing something, and so don't, uh, or they appear fear, you know, afraid of running away from something, don't try to solve it for them. Don't try to figure what they're dreaming. Just try to sort of quietly, gently lead them back to bed. You've heard this, this is not very uncommon. In the beginning, the parents would get scared and try to wake the child up to get them away from the dream. They're crying and screaming and just all you want to do is reassure and lead them back. Safety, this is key. So cameras locked so that they don't leave the house, alarms. Uh, this is probably the, one of the biggest reasons why kids have this persisting which is they're not getting enough sleep. So that sleep pressure is so high and you keep cutting their sleep short for their appropriate age that they just get stuck into the sleep-wake mode and they exhibit some of this. I had uh, a friend, a dear friend from India called, her daughter was having a lot of this and guess where she was? She was in an unfamiliar environment, tired with traveling and they were in a hotel room and she sort of woke up seeing this kid, daughter about nine years old trying to leave the hotel room in an unknown area, so she freaked her out. And the kid does this, and there'll be generally an uncle or an aunt or a grandma who did this a little bit, there'll be a genetic history, and then it fades off. So reassurance, sleeping enough, is the first step you do. Make sure they're getting enough sleep. Do they have a hidden electronic in bed that's keeping them up for an additional hour? You know? So, or two, eating into their sleep. So watch that, that's sort of a hidden pearl usually. Uh, air tag, <laughs> air tag the little electronic, however you want to do it. Uh, and seizures and sleep apnea are something that, that I will ask and look for once you are at the pediatrician. REM parasomnia, similar treatments for the dream uh, with which they recollect. Nightlight in family pictures. This is probably the only exception to where I say, fine, have a nightlight for a little bit. So that they, when they do wake up out of this, they feel like, oh yeah, they recognize the environment very quickly, that it's their room, and they calm down a lot faster than, than um, otherwise. Parents and kids should be re uh, reassured. Uh, image rehearsals, what is that? So if they're describing a recurrent dream, or this yellow dragon, green monster, lion, teeth, blood, you know, ghosts, yeah. so rehearse that and let them write that down. Thanks to Sycamore, they can write pretty well, so let them write that down and change the ending. Let them be the director of that movie and fix it. Like, oh yeah, that shows up, or you take out your Jedi sword and take care of them all, and everybody claps for you, and then the you know Tom Cruise homecoming happens on the Maverick, <laughs> and <everything's laughs> and a, so change the ending and and let them rehearse it. Let them say the story out to you without any umzas or pauses. So then they've got it locked, and that's what usually will replace that. So it's a and it's used in senior adults too. They use it in PTSD veterans. They use it in um, you know veterans with PTSD and. and and so it works. Medications really no role. So don't don't go for that because the problem is not solved. The medications are typically blankets for a little while. Fires still burning underneath. Uh, and then you have if they truly have some you know trauma and anxiety, then you can consider a psychology referral. And many times they'll lead you right back to this. So.
So if you've already figured that out, then that's the usual starting point. And if it's not working, then of course there's more cases that are more severe for that. Oops, well, Homer showed up too quick. Ooh. Are you clicking too fast? Snoring, very common, but really not normal. So what's habitual snoring? So snoring is the sound made from the back of your throat, the soft tissues that hang, the uvula, the sidewalls, all of us have heard it. And it comes in flavors like more than Baskin Robbins, right? With lots of snoring, purring, noisy breathing, uh, choking, gasping, uh, not breathing, only when they have allergies. So yes, they can have snoring when they have nasal obstruction right here. They have a small jaw thanks to grandpa uh, because the, the, the genetic you know, family jaw is a small, tucked back in jaw, tough luck, you know, uh, so they'll get a small jaw, so there's less real estate in their back of the throat. Uh, nine, 80 to 90% of snoring in adults comes from here. So don't fall for the fact that, oh yeah, it's just the allergies, oh yeah, I don't, and the individual never hears their snoring, generally. So in adults, this is a common theme, right? What are you talking about? I don't hear it. And then the videos show up, right? Oh yeah, that was just one night, three beers. I was traveling in Brown County, the allergies, the leaves, you blame this for like a decade. <laughs> and then you get the elbow, right? Then somebody's going to the ouch to couch. Then it's like, okay, now. So I had a dear colleague from the hospital, finally, uh, said, you know what? And he sent me patients for evaluation for snoring. He said, you know what? I think it's time. I said, what, what happened? Uh, we've spoken about this intermittently over the last three years. He said, now I'm in the guest room. I said, okay. And even then, she has to put plugs in her ears because the guest room is too close away. So sound does conduct well in solid. So I said yes. So yeah, so it can happen. And in kid, now back to kids, the tonsils are a big deal in kids because their airways are small, but the tonsils grow pretty quickly to full size. So they occupy a lot of real estate pretty quickly. So therefore, that becomes a first target of solving sleep apnea. And I'll tell you the difference between the two. Large tongue, again, they can't control that. And genetics, family history, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, somebody snored in the family, they get that genetic. So snoring, airway closes or reduces, oxygen drops, the body panics, jolts them with adrenaline, they go again and again and again and again. So that many potholes if you hit, even if you drive the best tank that is out there, it will hurt the tank over time. And it manifests differently in adults and in kids. So snoring versus sleep apnea. So just snoring is not generally a big issue unless it starts to combine with some flow loss. So apnea is Greek for no breath. That's not cool. And then daytime consequences. Something is not right because it's eating into your sleep quality now. And therefore, your overall sleep quota is shrinking because the quality is lost, right? And equal to sleep apnea. 2 to 28 percent of kids will snore. This is kids' data, and then 1 to 5 percent will genuinely have snoring combining with sleep apnea, and it goes really unnoticed for a long time, and then they suffer. How? First, how do they present? So, two, more than three nights a week in their usual state of health, no allergies, no pollen to blame, no leaves to blame, no sinuses, to, and they're just snoring more than three times. You can hear them on the monitor. You can hear them across the hall. Then labored breathing, gasps, snorting noises. Sometimes they'll even sit, mouth open. This is a classic actually. If you walk into the room and the mouth is open and they're breathing with the mouth open, that means they're trying to get more air in because through their nose, it's not opening the collapsing airway. So then they open them up. Then enuresis, this is what we talk about, right? Head wetting. This can happen. Headache, sleepiness, ADHD, and learning problems. That's how they manifest. And this is a big deal. The study in Louisville said that. 8 to 10 IQ points. They took first graders, they looked at the bottom of the class, bottom you know, percentile of the class, and said, okay. And then they figured out that, okay, about almost 50 to 60% of them had sleep issues. They solved it. Next grade, the grades went up. And they were no longer in that bottom quartile. So this is a paper almost 18 years ago. That's what just opened everyone's eyes. Oh, IQ points. And imagine a change of seven or eight IQ points changes the entire trajectory of their life can. So something to think about. So don't sleep on the sleep problems with your kids. Say something, do something. Consequences, behavior, cognition, growth and development. The three things that usually are the most key three pieces for a kid till they go and live life on their own. And if all the three are hampered, if their sleep is poor. And this is all measured stuff. So something 
to value? How do you test this? A sleep lab. Oh my God, who wants to sleep study? I don't want to go to the sleep lab. So, uh, so there are no needles. It's a comfortable environment. You can actually sleep with your child in their under 18, a parent must stay. Um, and it's, it's really not that hard. Remember, these kids are tired and sleepy anyway, right? That's why they get the sleep time. But they'll sleep. And they, they do well, Riley and all the kids' labs do well. So it's all, it's all, there's no needles. It's just, as soon as you say that, you start to see the glow in their eyes. Like, whoa, yes, now, now talk to me. No shots, no shots. There's goo and wires, that's it. And they take pictures and they're like, oh, look, 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 I was the, you know, we studied. Uh, so it's, it's really, yeah, I've done these three to four times on myself as participants, as researchers, as control. It's not that hard. Uh, it's washable glue. Uh, it's water soluble. There's a shower. You can actually shower before you leave. Um, and yeah, there's TV. There's slow Wi-Fi. Even. Adults uh, can do a home test. Kids not approved yet in the world. So you can do some at home. But if you see, there is no brainwave monitoring at the uh, home test, right? And if something pops off, the data is really you no know, good anymore. Now you have to come to the gold standard. But there is a tech watching you overnight. If something pops up, they walk in, they fix it back. And we have a lot of valuable data. Brainwave, breathing, breathing efforts, body position. Um, and then you have uh, carbon dioxide monitoring, oxygen monitoring, heart rate. So there's a lot that goes on. You get rich data from the lab. Even if it's a, not the best night of sleep, you'll get enough um, to make a good, good call. So if they have more than one, or f one to five breathing events per hour, it's called mild. And over 10 in kids, it's called se severe sleep apnea. And in adults, this number is sort of 5, 15, and 30. If you're more than these, you're mild, moderate, and severe. Sleep apnea. Treatments. In kids, this is actually the tonsillectomies and adenoidectomies are the first line of treatment because they occupy a lot of the airway. If they're enlarged, in, I want to say, two years ago, the data said that, remember back in the day, why would we get tonsillectomies in kids? Or well, some of you may have had them already. Why? 99% would be five strep infections a year, something like that, right? So recurrent strep throat infection, oh yeah, let's get these out, 99%. Up until the last two years ago, and I'm so, my heart gets warm when I say this, it's over half of our sleep apnea now. Over half of some two, 300,000 tonsillectomies done by ENT is half of sleep apnea. And I thank the Lord for that, because you're saving these kids a lot of poor sleep and poor lives in the end. So, I don't know if tons like me is the first. Patency improvement, if they truly have polyps and allergies, kids will because their noses are small, they're still developing steroids and certain medicines can improve and they can improve. Milder cases will respond to that. Dental appliances, a dentist can make an appliance for them to pull the jaw forward. Even adults can get a, a dental appliance made, it yanks your jaw forward, creates space so you breathe better at night. And in the morning you take this out and put it down. So it, it's actually a, a mandibular lower jaw advancement device. And then the orthodontist will do some maxillary expansions as well. So you've seen those expanders, and in certain cases they help by creating some space and crowding is reduced and all of that. And then CPAP. You've heard of CPAP, stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. Uh, 1981 was the invention. Back. So it's been around forever. It's air pressure to keep your airways open. Just like you go to the air hockey table at Dave and Buster's, you put in the coin, and and then the thing floats so beautifully, it's basically a cushion of air so that the vibration stops and you don't snore and all the downstream impacts go away. So it's kind of cool, right? So it's like a hovercraft, uh, choppy water, switch on the little air, it's off and it's flowing like there's nothing underneath. So that's the beauty of CPAP. It comes in 160 flavors. So don't, don't get afraid when, oh my God, giant mask, I don't want to be Tom Cruise, uh, you know, wearing this. Really, there's 160 other choices. That was 2001. And that picture gets flashed everywhere, like, oh my god, I hate it, I hate it. So there's a, there's a group of dentists, I don't like these dentists, that group, <laughs> <laughs> that, that started a website called IHateCPAP.com. <laughs> Would you believe that? Welcome to the free world, right? So really not knowing and just, so come, come, get my four grand worth of device, which works about 50% of the time, and we will stop using it because of the TMJ issues. They won't tell you that, but again, it was started, I'm just throwing it out there for you to keep in mind, don't get seduced by some of these things that keep showing up on threads. So you'll never see an advertisement for CPAP, never. I say never very rarely, never, because it works 100% of the time if you can find a combination 
that will work for you, your fits, your pressure. You'll see the ad for the cleaner. You'll see the ad for the tubing and this and that and travel pack and never for them because the thing works. It's air pressure. It's not a surgery. It's not a pill. It's not. It's nothing. If you put it on, you're you you're hundred percent resolved. So that's how you have to think about it in those terms. And restoring sleep, it's not removing the snoring. Another key thing is, it doesn't, yes, it solves the snoring, but what you're solving is restoring your sleep architecture so that the, the sleep can do its magic every night for you on the first, from the first night on. Okay, enough about that. That's the adult section. Let's get back to the kids. When the kid sleeps, everyone can sleep. When the kid doesn't, all shall we, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just wrote that last night. <laughs> Yeah. I, mean, I should, I, it's, it's, yeah, you won't find it. So, yes, everybody weeps because although the child is awake, the parents are mad, and yeah, look at that, right? So, at some point, somebody's going to lose it, and timeouts, and this, it just is not good. Right? Nobody's sleeping well if a child, or even an adult is sleeping poorly, for that matter. Flavors uh, are very classic. These are slightly younger kids. If you have, you know, toddlers up to age six and seven, they'll do this to you. Uh, so, onset, limit setting, onset association, and then a mixture. Uh, and then sleep loss of both the child and the caregiver, both are screaming at this point. 10 to 30 percent, one in three, so you have three kids, one of them is probably going to have a sleep issue based on the stats. So think about that. Every family may experience this. It's important to you know behavioral treatments and not medicines are really the solution. Sleep training about four months. Why? Because the circadian rhythm inside their brain starts to develop. Their bellies are big enough to hold enough food to last through the night. So if they're crying after six months, for a food, it's a pleasure, luxury, crime. It's really the theory, the scientific theory, they don't need that. At 4 a.m. feed at 7 months. It, now it's just luxury. I would. If somebody wants to play with me at you know, 3 in the morning and, and chit chat, I would like that. <laughs> if I have nowhere to be in the morning. So they do that too. They push you. So they can. So, but biologically, they, they don't need it. Just for you to know. Uh, if you have a young parent around you or a you know, sibling who has a young child. Onset, what is this? Child needs. Something to fall asleep and then, then need that something back again when they wake up in the middle of that. That something is usually you. Uh, you yeah. are their pillow, right? If your pillow falls down in the middle of the night, what do you do? Go and get it. Go and get it. You go, uh, you're good at it. So, so you, you become that pillow if you are you know, making them sleep on you or sleep. If you were there while they fell asleep, then you are their pillow. So that association starts to get established. Uh, rocking, watching TV, parent. What was that expensive chair, honey, that we bought? That little rocker chair. Uh, so you buy that, you put yeah. it in the bed, the little with the ottoman, and the whole thing swings like that. That's good. <laughs> I don't see them much anymore. Are they still around? You still are? Yes. Yeah. 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 So those are awesome. I was still on the bed. Chill out. But if, you, if your kid is falling asleep there, and then you transfer them to the little basset and crib, then that continues. Yeah, don't do that. They have to sleep, I mean, have to, as in, in this environment, uh, this part of the world, if they see you walk away and they get drowsy by themselves, that's probably the goal you're trying to get at. The quicker you get there, the better, sooner your, your lives get there, or the parents' lives get there. All right, they can wake up two to six times a night. Limit setting, this is a classic. One more hug, one more kiss, one more story, one more walk, one more this. It keeps going, and, and plus one. <laughs> And plus two, and plus three. What's that series? Two and two times two. Yeah, yes. uh, Mr. T has that, right? So it keeps going. It keeps going. So it, it won't end. So you have, and then crying, refusing to stay in bed, stalling, stalling. This is another two classics, and there's easy ways to solve them. Are you ready? Who's, so a little bit of heart is needed, and a little bit of patience. You choose what you want to deploy, and they can be deployed separately, and I'll show you how to solve that. Sleep training, unmodified extinction. Oh, fancy. This, uh, we used to call it cried out, suddenly it makes you feel like, oh, guilty, I'm a bad mom. Can't do that. I can hear them. Oh, they're getting louder, they're getting louder. Oh, no, oh, no. So, yeah, so it works four days. If you look at the data that's around this, no cortisol levels are increased, no scarring, no trauma. They won't hate you, uh, and things like that. There's the connotations around it, right? So, if mom is away on a, on a girl's trip, the dads usually can handle this a little bit better, is what the, the anecdotes say. And it's four days fastest, but difficult, less uptake. So they cry. sometimes they even throw up with their crap because they'll push. If you went to a vending machine, you put a coin in, and you saw the thing got stuck, what would you do? It came out, but it got stuck, a coke can. What do you do next? Doesn't. You give it another, and then it falls down. Oh, yeah, got it. What are you going to do the next time? 
So you can push, you can push, you can push. They will push. They will push. You are the coke machine. They will push. They will kick and scream. So they will get till their coke can comes up. But if the coke can doesn't, then they'll give up. They won't want the coke can. So that's basically the concept. Uh, modified extinction. A little easier. How do you do this? It takes longer. So complete the bedtime routine, ending in the child's room, say good night, be back in a minute, and go back in a minute. And then good night, same thing. And slowly what happens is they wait for you to come back. They, they, and they're not anxious because they know you're coming back. And you do come back. And then you come back, maybe a little later, maybe then you expand that time, you can. And then at some point they're just falling asleep waiting for you and it's not an issue anymore. Two to three weeks. But again, you've got to invest that. So your night is a little, you know, that start of your night is a little problematic. So you're pushing a lot of pauses on your Netflix streaming at that point. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> back and forth. Uh, the third one is graduated extinction, which is you start there, Sit, lay down, let them fall asleep, then chair, then move, then move, uh, then further away, further away, back into the hallway, and then yeah, two to three weeks. But you have to be, how, how does this work? This works if you are consistent, persistent, and flexible. This is what Dr. Sheldon uh, Chicago Children's taught me. Consistent pers and be persistent. But if they're ill, be flexible. If they're sick, if they've got a strep throat, they've got a tooth out, they got some sort of procedure, be flexible. You can be there a little longer. You can change the routine a little bit. Because rigid things break, flexible things bend. And they stay and then get back to the program. Pick the right weekend to start. Mom and dad have to be on the same page for this. One can't break halfway through. Uh, <laughs> so, yep, we used to hold the door of our uh, daughter's room, my grandparents. Uh, with their me, oh, don't go, I said, don't go, you'll be okay, don't go. They were, they're like, no, they're crying, she's crying so loud. Oh, so, so, so we did that in the hallway, and we, we survived. We did okay, she did okay, she made it to the school, so we're good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Expectations from both parent and child. Most common, why does this fail? You can say, oh, I've tried this. It doesn't work. Why? Because you, at some point, keep going away from the route. Oh, we're traveling. Oh, we're on a cruise. Oh, we're in a hotel. So don't do, don't pick that weekend that, or that duration for trying this. Oh, they're crying. We're in a hotel. Okay, come on. I have a meeting at 8. Okay, fine. Fine. Just to, And then the whole thing breaks again. Because what? The coke can fell after a few kicks. Mm. So they know. Oh, you're back to square one again. So then you've just undone your whole effort. And so, okay. Yeah, so routine. Keep the routine. Routines are awesome. 20 to 30 minutes. Repeat them. Pink and blue, if the toddler leaves the room a lot, do the two-pass trick, which is from University of Michigan, <clears throat> give them two cards. If they leave the room for no reason, they lose a card. If they leave twice, they lose the second card. <laughs> However, if they can keep the both cards till the morning, you walk in, there is a celebration. Like, yay, Johnny won. Both cards, prize. Yeah. Keep it reasonable. <laughs> Don't go crazy with candy and things. But it works. Pink for the girl, blue for the boys, however they want it, right? Uh, and then, and reinforce and, and make that a thing. Like, oh yeah, look at that. Six days in a row, two cards. Make the little check sheet and it works. Like that. It works. Now comes the teenager. This is probably the problem of our lifetimes, if you ask me. You've heard about school start times being delayed, the pressure on the high schoolers to go later than the kids. Why? So this is, this is a classic 15 year old, four alarms to wake up, 10 p.m. And then they fall asleep, they don't fall asleep till one. This is classic. I can see the nods and I just yeah. Uh, get on their phone because they're not able to fall asleep. They're good kids. I mean they're trying, uh, but they don't. And then it has to be up guess when? At seven. Uh, so they're following so they've gone from one to seven, right? That's six hours. Remember our little graphic that said nine to ten, eight to ten, thirteen, maybe aiming for nine at least. They're getting six or seven. <coughs> so now they're short, right? On the street, every day. Then weekends and summers are fun. And the weekends are great because they don't show up for breakfast, they show up for lunch, brunch, whatever you want to call it. Dinner, dinner, between lunch and dinner. Like they wake up somewhere between there. Um, easily on the weekends, no nighttime awakening. So it's not truly insomnia. And you can say, is this insomnia? It's truly not. It's, you, it's what we call a misalignment from the internal clock to that clock. And this is what we call delayed sleep phase disorder. So their body's melatonin is naturally delayed in release a little bit by an hour or two. And that becomes as they get into teenagers. So all will have this and by mid-twenties it reverses back. So internally there's a delay, right? They're not all of them are not brats. Most of them are, but not all. 
<laughs> so that delay happens. So this is called circadian misalignment. Once asleep, they sleep, no problem. That's the other distinguishing factor. So this is not genuine insomnia. Leads to daytime functional impairment, mood disorders, anxiety, depression has been seen uh, frequently with this scenario. Common in adolescence, prevalence is higher, 16%. It's actually high. In my mind, it's higher. It's just they measure it. Uh, so there's a measuring bias there. Treatable, but patients must be motivated to make changes. Now, how do we treat this? Right? Are pills the answer? Prescriptions? Not really. Uh, usually, I when know about the flight of Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> I, was gonna say, where did go? I just put it in this morning. Yes. Uh, okay, where did it go? Here, 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 here. here. Uh, by the way, 16 year old in my house, but I, I understand <laughs> every other part of that slide. Yes, yes. 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 So, why is it flight to Hawaii? Yes. Why, why do you think that makes sense? It'll solve in a day mm -hmm. because Hawaii is six hours behind us. Yep. So, this is what we call so social jet lag is what we all experience is induced, which is you sleep in on the weekends, you delay your bedtime by a couple of hours just because you want to live your life and have, and that's fine, but that's social jet lag. If you do it very frequently, Monday mornings become really hard because for the two preceding nights, you've been going to bed much later than your typical bedtime. It's much easier to delay bedtimes as a human, as a, as a mammal, than it is to advance your bedtimes all of a sudden. And you felt that when you travel west, it's easier to match LA and Hawaii uh, acclimate much quicker than when you go east in, in Europe and that part of the world. So it's much harder to pull up, it's much easier to delay. So Hawaii is exactly six hours, so if they go to bed at three or even four because they're delayed that much, it fixes it, zaps. One you show, the outside clock is matching their inside clock, so they're sleeping at 10, 11, pretty easy. Nine, they're, while you are falling at 5 p.m. <laughs> They are at the luau waiting <laughs> till like, oh yeah, we're dancing, like, oh my god, we're doing great. Uh, and then you're up bright eyed like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in Hawaii, the first night you arrive there, 4 a.m. And they're like still sleeping in easily at 7 a.m., they're seeing the sunrise, and you're waiting in darkness for the sunrise because you got up so early. So that's that's exactly where the Hawaii answer is. But what will happen? In another two weeks, they'll drift again, and then you'll have to fly to Japan. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, how do we truly solve this? Essentially, it comes down to, come on, don't get too happy now. Okay, so fix a, there, fix your wake time at 7, okay, fix it. Then, advance your bedtime by 15 minutes every 2 to 3 days till you've reached goal. So if they're sleeping at 1 a.m., and this again will take timing and vacation and planning because they have to have these two weeks to do it. So if you wake them up at 7, get them some sunlight, They'll be pretty tired. You'll increase their sleep pressure because you make them sleep less. Remember, sleep pressure happens when you're awake. So you pull that sleep time little by little by little every two to three days till you reach your goal. That's and then you can add a little melatonin at the front end. Melatonin pulls, light pushes our sleep rhythms. And pulling a car which is stall is harder than pushing a car that's stalled. But if you do both, you can move the car which is stalled easier. Imagine if your car is stuck, if you push it, you can. It's easier to just mechanically to get behind it and push it, but if somebody also pulled it, it gets easier. That's why melatonin doesn't solve it quickly. Yes, uh, John. that hypothetical 16-year-old that I just happened to have. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm curious about where evening exercise fits into this, yes. um, and, and if there's a sweet spot for it, if there's a time to avoid it, what it messes. The hypothetical 16 year old does like a hour, hour and a half workout at like 7 o'clock at night, and so yeah. you have to think of that. So, three hours is the sweet spot. Uh, intense activity, if you can avoid two to three hours before desired bedtime, then you're not going to interfere. Two to three. Two to three. Intense exercise. Now, light stretching is actually okay. A walk is actually encouraged. A chat. A screen-free activity, which is light, is actually okay. So that's your answer. So yeah, if they really pump iron and run hard on the treadmill and stuff. Yeah, he's doing a lot of that. Yeah, if there's a lot of aerobic involved, then it is going to wake you up because exercise, meals, light are all sight cavers for alertness. They're cues for alertness. So you don't want to do it in the evening. Uh, yes, great question. Avoid screens and bright lights in the evening for the exact reason we talked about because you don't want to suppress their natural melatonin drives. But then they'll further delay their sleep. So light in the evening will suppress their melatonin release. Melatonin release happens when there is dimming of the lights and signaling, hey, it's time to sleep. Melatonin is not 
a traditional sedative. It's like the lunch bell. Oh, there you go. We're in a school. It's like the lunch bell. It's not the lunch. It's a signal that, yeah, it's lunchtime, but it's not the exact lunch. That's how you got to look at melatonin. Oh, it's not working. Yeah, melatonin doesn't work for genuine insomnia, which is an adult thing, but it's the signal, not the solution. But in these scenarios, it's very powerful to move their body clocks. Because they don't have a problem sleeping, it's just they, they can't sleep when they want to sleep in terms of timing. It's a great timing adjuster. It's not a great, oh, took this and I'm out in 15 minutes. Yes, and here we go, the melatonin. It's a hormone derived from tryptophan, pineal gland. It releases, it stimulates uh, the MT1, MT2 receptors in the brain. It's inhibited by light. That's why this light, light is becoming a big deal because at night, our pupils are nice and dilated. You get this thing right in your face, and now all that light goes into a dilated pupil, and it's, oh, it's wake time. And the melatonin suppresses. And as it is, the teens have a delay, they're released by an hour or two by biological design. Now you just put another hammer under the nail that was already half in. So now that's it. It's hard to undo that. Uh, and guess what they're seeing on their screens anyway, right? So all uh, sort of stimulating, depressing video games, uh, social media threads. I mean, nothing's happy and telling them, all right, it's time to switch the, switch the phone off mm -hmm. and enjoy some sleep. Never that. <laughs> right? So... <laughs> Uh, it's categorized as a supplement, and I don't think it should be, uh, but it is. Uh, it's prescription in many countries, we talked about that. And then the other question is, will it go, is it going to reduce their own ability to fall asleep? It's not. So endogenous melatonin rhythms will maintain themselves, or even though you take exogenous melatonin. Uh, pros, it's easy to find in the US, everything else is so regulated, somehow melatonin skipped that line, and it's available, so used correctly you can. Uh, it's, it can be helpful for sleep uh, in children with autism and ADHD as well as typical children as well, normal kids who are growing well, low side effect profile, low cost, multiple preps, gummies and talk about us to make types of cereal, right? So we have zillions of cereals, why can't we have zillions of melatonin flavors? We do. Uh, cons, nobody knows, this is where the problem is, nobody knows the long term side effects of these things. No one. Uh, again, I recruit, would you recruit a child, would you help? to study 30 years of you know 10 milligrams of melatonin every day now. So it's hard to do that. They know that there's some early signals that are coming are delayed puberty. It's a puberty delay if some signals are not strong enough but we have seen that if you take a lot of melatonin consistently, there's a delay in puberty signal that's happening. So something to watch for. If, uh, dose timing is important. Little evidence to support use in maintenance insomnia, which is they fall asleep, okay, but they get up 10 times a night for some reason. So think through that problem rather than throw melatonin at it. And over the counter prescription, there was this, the greatest hits paper three years ago said, it's the same bottle that says three milligrams can have from 0 0.5 to 15 milligrams of melatonin with added serotonin and this and that. And so it's variable. Some of the reliability on the preps that we see on the shelves is very variable. And this got published in a sort of high uh, impact journal in the world of speed. So know that. So try, pick a brand you trust, uh, and so something like that. Just because the kid wants the cherry red gummies doesn't mean it's going to be a decent brand. When to seek help? When the bear is staring at you. <laughs> 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 if there was some sound in there. That's fine. That's probably my hair. Okay. Bed time. So the bear's questionnaire. That's where it comes from. The bear's questionnaire is an easy tool. Uh, from the uh, Perlman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania, they say uh, bedtime problems. So there's a preschool, school age, and adolescence. You could probably keep this just as a screener for parents. You know, this probably is a good idea just to keep. It. If they're having bedtime issues, that is falling asleep. If they have excessive daytime sleepiness, so that's your E. Um, that means they're super sleepy through the day. If they awaken a lot at night, right? So kids generally should not awaken once they're falling asleep. Generally. Should if they are awakening one, two, three, or four, then there's an issue there. Um, R is regularity and duration of sleep. So does your child have a regular bedtime and wake time? This is probably the single most boring but the most impactful thing you can do for your kid. No fancy light and blanket and noise and sound machine and sleep sheep and I have all of those. We went through all of those. <laughs> as a sleep professional, none of them are as powerful as a regular sleep wake. It's the most beautiful and boring, but most powerful thing you can do. 
Uh, sleep disorder breathing, don't ignore the snore. If there is a snore, talk through that, have a monitor, record it, do what you need to, follow that because that can deplete quality of sleep. So that's your BEARS, it's available, it's a quick screen, it increases yield times four. It helps you get to the problem quicker rather than, you know, keep blaming the child for the behavior and keep dragging this till now they're in high school, now they're in college, like, and suddenly they're older, blink, they get older. So, poor sleep, now this includes the adults. Behavioral issues can happen, anxiety, depression, productivity, lost, cognitive lapses, accidents, immunity loss, more infections, weight gain can happen from poor sleep. Uh, it's hard to lose weight, they're all nicely published papers, because when you sleep less, your inflammatory cycles are higher, your stress hormones are higher, and if you're hungrier, angrier, and you tend to eat more. I'll show you one slide there, nice little thing. Mortality, you live less if you have sleep apnea. Untreated sleep apnea, seven years lost, is an estimate from all across the world. Seven less years um, of quantity. That was from Guns and Roses, but didn't come out right. That's <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> so, uh, yes, what is the most effective tool? And this was during COVID. I made this slide and I just keep it because the pandemic is still a little bit in the rear view. You can still see it. Like when you stare, you can see the lights in the rear view. So I leave this slide there. It's your immune system, the most powerful tool you have. And sleep and immunity are good friends. The first half of the night, those four, three, four hours, there's a lot of gunfire happening in your body. A lot of pro-inflammatory chemicals are being released, germs are being killed, removed, enemies are being destroyed inside. And immunological memory, mug shots are being taken of these germs, they're putting it into your T-cells, like, hey, these dudes show up again, take care of them. So that's why you don't get sick from the same bug as often, uh, many times. And then the second half of the night, then the cleaning crew is here, collecting all the shells and the, the waste products of these battles that have happened, macrophages, the spleen is like, oh man, I have to do this all the dumpster cleaning again, you guys brought a lot of trash again, and this happens night after night. And this is, I say this in an oversimplified, entertaining way, uh, because if you sleep less, now think about sleeping less. So if this cycle takes seven to eight hours and you sleep six, guess what happened here? You lost your cleanup, anti-inflammatory proteins, from being released. So now your balance tilted in favor of inflammation. So, that, so that's why sleep deprivation is a pro-inflammatory state, just by that simple equation. So now you chronically sleep deprive yourself, even if it's an hour, you're constantly fueling that inflammation and you're reducing your anti-inflammatory. This whole chatter about antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, free radicals, it's all over the internet. All these pseudo-specialists are yapping on their little threads uh, or pro uh, this, that, supplements. It's right here. If you slept well, you would, your body would take care of it. You don't need fancy berries that are 60 bucks uh, in a supplement from GLC. You don't need them. If you just slept well and you ate whatever served, the regular fruit at Kroger, whatever is in season, you generally be fine. So, so think about that. There's a simpler solution there. Poor sleep, this is the immune system. More colds, University of San Francisco, uh, San, yes, UCSF did this. More common colds in people who slept less. Uh, vaccines less effective. Their antibody responses are less. So if you are getting a shot, try to sleep a little, a few days before that, get your sleep in order because you'll get the most out of that shot. Uh, your white blood cells, your soldiers are less effective. They're lethargic if you sleep less. Uh, reduce sticky molecules. They, they fire these tasers at the germs and they make them stick. That is lesser if you sleep less. And your soldiers don't hear well. Your white blood cells don't go to the site of the problem as easy. There's slower migration. So that's why if, you, if you've ever had steroids, or somebody has had steroids given to them for anything, their white blood cells count rises. Because steroids tend to just increase those, but they don't migrate well. So that's why although your white blood cell counts rise when you have steroids, you're still more susceptible to infection. Have you said that, oh my god, they're on steroids, therefore they're immunocompromised. You've heard that before, right? So why? Steroids actually increase your white blood cells. But they don't, they can't migrate. They're like, oh yeah, you have them but they don't have a vehicle to ship them. So they're all standing here, but they can't go to Louisville where the battle is or wherever. Pick your favorite state, you know. So, they, so that's why, that's how you think about uh, why that's a problem. And who would like that sleep? I would. So I used this uh, in my talk at Lily a few years ago. It's the butterfly effect, which is um, you cannot get good sleep by chasing it, right? Just like a butterfly. If you're trying to capture a butterfly, or at least try to hold it, 
you run behind it, you're not going to win. So nobody sleeps better by trying harder. Remember this forever. This is a line by Daniel Erickson, a colleague in field. No one sleeps better by trying harder. You can get better at math. You can get better at TMRs. You can get better by trying harder. At yes. Uh, but you cannot get better at sleeping by trying harder. But you have to try hard there. <laughs> it, it's it's not. Uh, you only sleep worse by staring at the ceiling, staring at the clock. Think about the last time you woke up and said, "Oh, 2:22. Oh, I have another three hours and 46 minutes to sleep. Great. How beautiful is that?" And you went right back to sleep. Yeah. No. So you try, you fail. Don't try. That's the butterfly chasing versus sitting still, let the butterfly come and perch on you. That's how. Clear the runway is what I say for sleep success. Rhythmicity is key. Signaling the body, this Pavlovian, right? Remember the Pavlovian classic example. Ring the bell, um, call the dog's name, have the food, do it three weeks. That bell at any time of day makes the dog salivate. So it's, if you repeat, 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 you start to teach. And you pick a rhythm that you like, a routine that you like. Avoid the caffeine second half of the day. This works both for kids who are eligible for caffeine. And uh, for not, then you remove that. Intense exercise close to bed, that answers your question. Three hours. Winding down is a great idea, screen free. Uh, we've talked about why. Dark, cold, and quiet. Uh, avoid the homework. No screens in bed, it's a great idea. Just keep the bed free of this distraction and stimulation. Boring, they'll find it boring. It really is the most powerful, and they'll see. Yeah. We we have a reading habit before bed. How is the light in bed? Because you gotta have light to read. Yes. So dim lights are fine. Yellows are okay. If you have the Kindles that have just the light with no time cues on them, and if the, if it's an e-reader, is it a book or an e-reader? Books. Even better. Yeah. Even better. Uh, it's fine. A little reading light is actually soothing. The left to right movements on the they call saccadic movements on the on the reading is actually soothing for the brain and it actually makes you drowsier. So it's at that time it's great. Their sleep pressures are high, their alerting signals are dropping, and they're doing something that promotes drowsiness. Perfect. A little yellow light with a timer, or you can even switch it off, and, and they will find it easier to go back. Or give them a non-fiction book. Give them a non-fiction book. Non-fiction yeah. book. Yes, yes. Content matters. If they want to get to the end of the book. Um, then there's, there's another question there. But if it's light reading, if it's pleasure reading, they can continue on. It's fabulous. First grade, you give them whatever they will read. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. But aren't you supposed to have text well lit? I mean, their eyes developing too. Yeah, great point. So you've got to draw the balance between the right amount of intensity. So avoid whites. If I were, if I was advising on the lights. Avoid white light. So yellows are easier because they are a little further away from the blue spectrum. The blue green 470 odd nanometers is very, very sensitive. It's very impactful to your circuitry for wake sleep regulation. That's why this blue light has become out of control. But then the truth in that is right there. So if you stay, so you go to yellow red side of that seven color spectrum, you're going to be a little less impactful. And then the intensity is light, low anyway. And if it's from a uh, from a distance rather than in their face with these bright LEDs, phones, and reader, then that there's the problem. Um, Kindle, I said yes to the Kindle. The problem didn't solve. The kid came back with the mother about six months ago. I didn't realize that Kindle. I don't have a Kindle. Um, uh, they have this Kindle Fire and the seven flavors of Kindle, which basically becomes an iPad-like device. So they have all kinds of toys in there. Oh, jeez. I meant that little thing in my mind. The Kindle are old-fashioned now. The paper white yeah. only book. Like, what happened to that? Like, oh, oh you meant that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I did mean that. <laughs> so, so, yes. And then short nap and recharge. For adults, in the middle of the day, 10 minutes. And I'm going away from the word nap, because nap is a pressure to sleep. It almost culturally, hey, go take a nap. <laughs> okay? I tried, mom. Oh, oh geez, my 15 minutes are done. So it's a pressure to sleep. So don't do that. So it's a pressure to just relax, unwind. Don't try to think and attach to thoughts. Sounds very philosophical and meditational. It is. And, it'll, and if you time it within that dip of the 2 to 3 p.m. that I showed you, it actually feels better when you get up from this. If you slept, great. If you didn't, great. 15, 20 minutes, ideal. Adults, I do it in my office in, a, in an exam room if, uh, over lunch. I just uh, shut the door and 
get feel get throw a yoga mat in the office. Uh, it's quiet and it actually feels really good. So try that. Add it, you won't be you can't lose, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And don't sleep on your sleep issue. Sleep apnea, insomnia, don't sleep on them. Because they they will they have impact. And we are at the end of this. Wow, this went longer than I thought it would. And you guys are all here awake. <laughs> okay. So if your outsides are good, your insides are good, you will get refreshing sleep. It comes down to basics, mind and body, and then outside environments. You can regulate this. There's nothing stopping you. And with that, uh, who's ready to use the washing machine? Yes, you are. And questions. <laughs> and this is from Robert Frost. That's all I have for you. Thank you for your attention. This was fabulous. An honor to present at the school that I wish I could go to. <laughs> Is there any way to like really like a 10 to 12 hours? You know, well, we're at like 9:45. Is that enough? He, he wakes up himself. Yeah. How, how do, is there a way to determine when we're getting enough sleep? Yes, yes, there is, and it's a fabulous question you ask. And I must credit, and I wrote about this in the little book uh, which uh, Tiffany mentioned, and it's called "What's Your Sleep Number." So Charles Bay from UPenn talks about this, is how do you determine what your sleep number is as an adult, as a child, as any age group. So those are gui guidances, right? Those are bell curves, sort of to say. From, and those are all observational. So they've never tortured people to figure that out. They can't. Uh, so on, a, on vacation, for adults, this is how it works. So on vacation, if you have a week or something, try to live alarm-free, okay? So naturally fall asleep, naturally wake up. And don't do it for one night or two, but a good seven, eight days. Because the first couple of nights you just recovered from sleep deprivation. So in seven nights, you will know what your natural preference for falling and waking up is, and there your number will start to emerge. That you're waking up naturally without anybody screaming or the alarm screaming or the kids screaming at you, like, okay, yeah, so that's your adults usually will fall in that sleep number. And you also learn your preference. When does your body, are you an owl? Are you a lark? Are you a normal? And you know that amongst you. Some of it is genetically determined. You're easier, you know, you're good. Some people like being owls. They love their chips, work across you. Some people love being large pipe. They're in the gym, bang, bang, they're up at four, no matter what. Jeez, bless those people, I'm not that. <laughs> <laughs> but normals are somewhere 10, 30, 11 to about 6 or 7, something like that, right? So that's for adults. For kids, same way. If he wakes up, fine. If, he, if the kid is going to sleep without resistance, he's not deferring, stalling, and he falls asleep, he wakes up, the grades are good, behavior is good, he's eating, he's growing, and that's the number, 945 probably is that number. And it comes, a similar example is when you lose naps, right? So our young one lost a nap at the earliest part of the nap loss spectrum. Like, oh God, why did you do this? Right? If we slept some more, we could have had a longer lunch. But no, you're, you're not napping. Jeez. So she's walking around with all these kids in, in her kindergarten thing, sleeping, napping. Sweetly, four-year-olds, you know, this thing's up with strolling and doing, you know, like watches over them, right? So, so and there's the variation for you. So, all those things in order, behavior, cognition, mood, performance, in however way you can measure it in an age-appropriate way. And if he feels good, he's good. He wakes up a lot during the night. Is there any advice on that? And what happens? When and how? And how many times? And what happens after that? It's regular. Like An hour? I know exactly. No, it's usually around like 11 and then might be at 2.30. And then might be again at 4.30. 6, 5, 7? Seven. 7. Okay. And what does he do when he gets up? You watch him on the monitor? Do you have one? No. no. He does it. He calls for me. And then what happens? I come over and, and then he's out. Yeah. So he goes back now. Now, how? what is his sleep onset routine? Like, how does he fall asleep? I... <laughs> yeah. So... Yes, yeah, so if you're there, and you've answered the question, so if, I think so. So if you're there when he's out, okay, and it's normal for kids to stir and wake up two to four times a night in that age group, right? it's normal. But going back to sleep is dependent on how they fell asleep the first time. Okay. If you were that pillow they were cuddling with, or you were around, they want you back. And you go, and guess what happens? He sleeps. Yeah. Right. So you've got to slowly dissociate 
yourself from the sleeping takeoff. Like you've got to leave the airplane before it's left the ground. Like you've got to step out of the jet bridge and let the door close and say bye. And slowly do this. It's not harming him because you go there, but it's eating into your sleep routines as well. Is what I'm sensing. Yeah. It gets more interesting. And um, tell me. So he doesn't really have nightmares or night terrors, but he has very active imagination. So left alone, he starts imagining things. So like not asleep, he's awake. And then that prolongs the... Going back to sleep. Yeah, so then the fix is actually exacerbating the condition. The fix. So fixing is making him, like me not helping him fall asleep, yeah. will result in him being Staying deprived away from sleep. Yes, so it goes back to the, the piece of when are you ready to extinguish this pattern because it's only continuing, it's perpetuating and it's become routine, it's become Pavlovian now for him to go through some of this. So it has to, either you unplug and it's seventh, it's going to be harder because they have imagination and words and vocabulary oh, yeah. and actions. So you've got to go back to the basics of the, of the starting bedtime routine, have a conversation, they can understand this, say hey this is not good for you, for mommy, everybody needs to sleep. These many awakenings are not good. Just have that chat. And do you think we can change this if you're able to reason if he's there? I'm sure he is. Um, at least open to the discussion idea. Start there and then it will extinguish. It's just because it perpetuates and you're there. You become the element of perpetuating this, this, this breaking of sleep. How does he do when he's not in his usual sleep environment? Let's say you guys are traveling somewhere. Does this still happen there too? Hotels, vacations. Well, that's actually his preferred way because you're just in one room, right? <laughs> Sometimes, you know, it's just like a king size bed. So everybody's just there and he's sleeping and he sleeps okay. He doesn't get up much or he gets up, he goes back to sleep much faster. Yeah, he will not wake up. So I'm reminded of Taylor Swift's favorite line like, Hi. It's me. I'm the problem. It's me. That, 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 that. I'm not saying you are, but I'm saying you. No, I know. I know we are, but um, the whole falling asleep. It's, it's like, how do I fix my mind from sending images? Like, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> this may not be a fix, but my nine, almost ten year old uh, has a very active imagination. Yeah. For a very, you know, sleep for him is always like. Think, think, think. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Often, as much as he loves to read, uh, drawing for like a good amount of time. I mean, he loves to draw, but drawing for a good amount of time before bed is actually. Like, he listens to a lot of audiobooks. Like as much as he loves to read, and he's a very capable reader. Sometimes just being able to draw and create, and I find like over time that kind of. But he still, you know, he does not fall, you know, asleep as quickly as I would. Old. Yeah. Um, and he doesn't, you know, he used to, we used to joke and be like, you know, Charlie up, you know, it was like in the morning, and now that was until seven, seven and a half, but now as he gets a little bit older, it's not, you know, as easy. With the sunlight now, it is a little bit, but um, the drawing, it's I don't know, sometimes just be able to, you know, put that imagination, imaginative stuff down rather than like reading and thinking okay. more. Yeah, so the, the starting routines are key. Like what happens at bedtime, restructuring that, and even some, like like you said, very, very, I was going to say, you know, writing out whatever he's thinking is a great idea because then he can make it positive if he can and continue the storyline rather than awaken in the middle of the night and then going. It's hard. It, it'll take a bit. It, like I said, again, it gets worse before it gets better, but you will have to sort of restructure that bedtime routine. And as he ages, it's going to get better too. In a matter of you know a year or That's two. That's so far the best answer I've given him. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. <laughs> yeah. but he yes. wants it to get better. Oh yeah. yeah. He's like I can't wait till I'm eight because then it's going to go away. So it bothers him that he gets up. It bothers him that he gets up. The, the images in his mind that he's when he's left alone in bed yeah. and he comes up with these images and they bother him. Yes, and it goes back to the rehearsal technique that we talked about, right? So maybe scripting 
a story and writing it because he sounds like he's a creative young fellow and it's great. Yeah. And and so writing the story that ends well or he controls it and reading it out to you, I think could be a starting point. And then it's already rehearsed and has a higher likelihood of showing up again. And then he identified it and then it will be less bothersome because it's predictable. And to start there, and as long as his you know behavior, performance, daytime stuff is going well, well it seems. the routines up front will be great. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. He's fine. Um, I have a question about the change from summer to winter. Yes. Like right now, like after the time change, oh my goodness, I'm so happy the time changed. Yes. Because we are now going to bed an hour earlier because. Yeah, it tired just, of it. Well, we're, we're, we're in that rhythm, and so we just stay on uh, that same. So, my whole half my clocks in my house are um, <laughs> sometimes because my, I need to change my own mental. But summer to winter, and summer it is light until way forever. in forever. Yeah. And, and I know part of this is me because yeah. my work <laughs> changes dramatically from summer to winter. Um, when I'm inside, summer, I'm outside all day long from sunrise to sunset for me. Um, so I'm, that change, how do you get a kid, my kid's five, yeah. to go to sleep in Indiana so right. at <laughs> 5.30 in the summer? Because to her, the sun is like halfway up the sky. Yeah, but two answers to that. The first one is we have We've aggravated this problem. So time is a human construct, right? So yes. we've created these numbers to make it convenient to ourselves, to run things, and I get that. The universe doesn't need to have that. It has its own timing, which is sun is highest at noon, mm -hmm. and it sets. And we keep tinkering with this one hour here, one hour yeah. with our cake. Oh my God, don't even start me there. Uh, it doesn't have, and then add to that, we have daylight savings. You're not saving anything. You're robbing it from the morning. Yeah. And making the mornings darker and putting it at night, both kids getting hit by school buses and standing in the dark. Okay, so let's not even go with that little sad story there. Uh, but the switch, yes, it's a challenge, right? So it's very bright, it's active. So going back to, and people do sleep lesser in the summer. So don't hang yourself up on that saying, oh my God, I'm not getting my, you know, my particular hours. And yes, if it's like, and the eastern edges, sorry, the western edges of the time zones get hurt the most. Mm -hmm. And guess where we are, right? Oh, yeah. so because of this switch is really drastic mm -hmm. to us. Uh, back to what do we do? So we do basically, uh, you do what you can in terms of darkening, having wind down routines and having the five year old. And again, in two years, they'll be older, they'll be sleeping a little lesser, so you'll be managing the problem, but that's what you do now. So have a routine, dimming curtains, dark, we did that, like complete dark, yeah. choose a room in the house for them that doesn't see the sun in the evening, it's an east window room, so it's pretty dark, so your west window rooms won't have the light coming at them, so little things like that, iPads, those are the best things, the iPad that is three bucks, right, so eye shades, so, so even at like dinner, would you like darken your like your dining room and kitchen room windows? If, I know, and then you can't control that because the house is already fixed, the lights already coming. You could start that. If you have whites, try to dim them yeah. for the kid. If you have yellows, a little easier on the eyes. If you have shades that can come down, they can come down. And then let them go to bed, and then you guys do your thing in the evening. You can step oh, yeah. out if you can. <laughs> so don't miss that opportunity to be out. He actually does that. We'll be eating dinner and he'll dim the lights. Yes. What are you going to eat? <laughs> 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 going to dinner. It's just habit now because it's so bright. These lights are just so bright. So that should hopefully help. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, not questions, but one deep appreciation. Um, I, I'm loving being here, not just uh, from the education world, but as parent of a 16 year old. Um, We've had two out of our three kids sleep talking. It's the freakiest thing. Yes. It's just it's like three yes. sentences. Come on. Um, I, I shared with, uh, for those with jaded middle schoolers, uh, I shared with Katie Baker, uh, this is great for you, about uh, seven ways to maximize misery, knowing that middle schoolers will focus on misery over happiness, um, but it, you know, it's all reversed, and one of which being like, make your bedroom your all room, mess with your sleep cycle, this is the way that you can really uh, make things uh, bad, so reinforcing the messages, uh, but it's a fun video to see. Uh, and the other one being just literally as we're having these conversations and thinking about our, not that every conversation is a fundraising conversation, but I'm just going to, uh, we are thinking a lot about the lighting um, in, in the media.
community center and the ability to have that control of beyond just sort of the solar tubes that we've got, but additional lighting because for all the reasons that we've already shared. So very much on our minds. Excellent. No, I, I appreciate all of that. So yeah, it's coming. I mean, this is something we should all get better at. And we can really improve our lives, health, performance, and every age group can actually benefit from this if we just invested a little more. And there's a lot of noise around right now in the media and pop culture, so be careful of what you're reading and always verify. Uh, but don't sleep on your sleep problems. Yes? I don't know if you'll have any advice on this, but so I've got teenagers, boys, who are, you know, it's the waking up. And if, if I, if, and again, if we're not present when like adults are not around to monitor this, there is a 50-50 shot, that, at least, that they sleep through every of the four alarms. Any advice <laughs> on, <laughs> is there any, like, what, any, any tricks, any alarm advice, anything like that on getting them up what, on their own? Yes. I, I, because this is their responsibility, not mine. Yes. <laughs> taking the remote schooling from Hawaii. No, it, yeah, it, I, I, if I could, I would. <laughs> so it's the delay that exists in their body. Some kids right. will demonstrate this more. It's probably the genetic. There are probably owls to begin with as personalities. And if they have relatives or family members who yes. are owls late night. So it's, yes, it's they transferring. Are. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, transferring yeah. to them. Again, fixing that, it, it'll be painful for the first couple of weeks. Fix, fix, it. fix the bedtime yeah. and then slowly pull up their sleep time if you can. Okay. And a, a little bits and pieces of melatonin taken uh, and two hours before desired bedtime, right. not okay. actual, will start to tug at their sleep rhythms. Okay. And once they're locked, then they're good. Then don't let them sway for more than a week on the weekend. What happens is this. Yes. They struggle okay. through the week, they'll get up somehow for school or high school, and then comes the weekend. Yes. And then it's just like you stretch, stretch, stretch the elastic band, and you boom, it's back to where it was again. And Monday's a trauma again because they're struggling on Monday. So that's how you change the cycle don't by regular as much as you can. Don't sway more than an hour. An hour. Okay, that was my. On the weekend. Yeah, okay. It's hard. Try to get a teenager to buy that deal. Yeah, it's I know. boring. <laughs> but sell them the performance, the mood. You Get less yelled at, some reward mechanisms if you yeah. can see the teenagers. Well, the out. one going to college is starting to realize that this could be a real problem. <laughs> because, you know, there's, there's that's no the one awakening. around. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the, yeah. Because they're going to compete in the real world now, right? So everything yeah. is how fresh are you looking, how presentable, how alert, how much you're learning, and it's expensive school that you've got to go to, wherever it is. Yeah. Uh, so you want to waste that. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, great, great point. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I don't even think, I don't even know where the question is, I don't know where the answer is, but we're all in the room, and those of middle schoolers, we might and say, what device do you have when they have homework? And you've got, and they're going through this, I've got homework, and it's not done, and it's like 10, 11, 12, and it's on the computer, and there's a blue light, and sometimes you're prioritizing what they're actually going to get done versus what they're going to stare at. Yeah. And, I mean, I know a couple weeks ago, I had a kiddo that was up till midnight, midnight, 2 a.m., midnight, almost, four days in a row, getting their stuff done. Um, I vote sleep in an email. So, <laughs> it's, it, but it's a challenge. I mean, it, it is. That homework load yeah. in middle school is a real challenge with sleep, especially if you live far away, and especially if you do all the stuff that happens in the morning before school starts. So, I mean, and then we'll like never get up. the physical activity to get to less than six. Yeah, I mean, we've got to get five thirty or six every day. Yes, yes. And yes. It actually works for my kids. If you tell them. All that stuff that you just studied, it goes in at seven hours, so don't get less than seven hours of sleep. So, okay, take it down. Correct. But. Yeah. They still end up without their stuff done, and they're still in the car, and like it's a battle that they feel. I feel. Yeah, great points. There's a practical, real-world spots, right? So they have to plan, and maybe it's an earlier uh, age where they have to really start looking at their schedule, and they may not be ready mentally to be able to do that. And just a plan prioritizing uh, is probably how they'll succeed. Maybe this is their rude awakening into prioritizing. And blue light filters, dimming the screens, yes, all those help. But the mental stimulation is also just as key in delaying their sleep onset. Because if they're excited or stimulated by that problem or homework or math or whatever they're researching, then it's tough. Yeah, 11 or midnight for a middle schooler is, is late. Um, can, they do diff can they do it differently? Can they get more time? Start doing it in bits before rather than all of it at the last minute, like how I live my life, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it is time to do it. 
to, to do that. Uh, that's the one solution. You're right. Um, there, there is there's that challenge that they have to think through and prioritize. I mean, in our case, it's like how much of it is actual work, how much of it is like Taylor Swift that's streaming in the background. Mm -hmm. you know, which, like, that's the other right. Yes. So it's be like, this is yeah. the work. This should take you an hour and a half. Do it right. Maybe like, what Spotify's else is going on? Going. Like, don't be listening to music while doing this. Hundred percent. So concentrate thing. your focus. Yeah. So try to work through that. Like, what what is what can they do to make this finish quicker? And in an accurate way. So yeah. So those are distractions, um, you know, devices, communications between friends. Oh, but I'm talking about homework. I said, come on, <laughs> uh, get it done. So like I, I've watched, I've watched, and they're fairly efficient. Okay, that's uh, good. It's not, it's not too much of the rest. But the hardest thing is, if you don't like to write an essay, you just can't make yourself write an essay. Yeah. So that's that's the only place where there's a lot of, a lot of. Yeah. But sometimes I will sit there. And Tell me your homework again, and I'll yeah. say, how long is that going to take you? That one always takes you 20 minutes. That one always takes you 35 minutes. Yeah. And I add it up, and all of a sudden, you get that, like, you know, 5 o'clock. I'm like, you have to start now, because I think you are yes. going to be working until 11.30. Start now. And right. they're like, no, no, I don't have six hours. I'm like, oh, yeah. History yeah. will take you this long. Science will take you this long. Math always takes you're you this there. Like, right. I can go through, and they're like, oh, wow, you're right. I have five and a half hours of homework. That's and, wonderful parenting. I think that's their root. Not rude, but now that's their awakening into how to manage this time. It's tough. Life is, you know, going to be harder. So I think it's a real world example of yes, protect your sleep. And tell them this that if you really pull all nighters, it really doesn't help. All nighters, you forget most of the stuff that you were preparing for. If you vomit on a test at 8 a.m. after staying up, it doesn't work. So to really learn that and use that, it has to go sink in all the stuff that we learned. So we do that a lot. We, yeah. we, we talk about that a lot, and I'll tell them. I'm said, yeah. do nothing else. Yeah. Do 10 minutes of flashcards for your test three days from now because you'll sleep on yes. it. The more nice sleep. sleep you have, the better. And they're they're good. Both my kids are actually very aware yeah. of that. And but this is the time they, late. Yes, they can. This is the time where they can catch up a little. This is the halfway result, halfway answer to your question. Is they pro they should catch up on the weekends a little more. They probably do. Yeah. With sleep. Um, and so we keep trucking, and you know, and they keep prioritizing it. And also the uh, the sports schedules and their activities also then become so that's another thing I think as a generation I don't know how is this a problem it wasn't a problem a while back now suddenly so many other sport activities that have taken place that I feel like thank God I don't have Zoe's schedule because geez I would be so swamped and I, I 